I'm here happily with Lily. Hello, Lily. Hello. And Anna. Morning, Al. And Kamara. Hello. And we have remotely with us uh, Emily Harnett, who is joining us from Hello. New Haven, Connecticut. Hello. And we also have uh, a poet and translator, distinguished poet and translator in Japan, and that's Yosuke Tanaka. Hello, Yosuke. Hello, how are you? We're so pleased to have you join us. And uh, the occasion here is a poem by Michio Nakamoto, and it's been translated by Yosuke Tanaka, as well as Jeffrey... Engels. Jeffrey Engels, that's right. The two of them have translated this and a number of other poems that um, are appearing in a special issue of Jung Journal, and the subtitle of the journal is Culture and Psyche. And if you're interested in looking for this poem and others, you'll be looking for volume 10, number one. And we're going to talk about this one poem by Nakamoto called Vernal Equinox, um, which is interesting for Maud Poe for a number of reasons. For, for one thing, it's, it's a wonderful poem. For another, it, Nakamoto is a self-described imagist who began uh, during the mid-1980s to publish in... Uh, in women's poetry movement magazines, one of them called La Mer, as a self-described imagist feminist. And just the idea in Maud Poe of working with a poet who thinks of herself as both an imagist and a feminist in the contemporary period is in itself interesting. So I've asked Lily to read the poem, and then we'll all talk about it. And um, there's only one person in the group, and that's Yosuke, who has read the original. Uh, and understood the original, to be sure, because he translated it. So there might be some occasion to um, ask Yosuke to tell us a little bit about the particularities of translation, especially of an imagist poem. So Lily, would you read it? Vernal Equinox. Along the zodiac, a white man walks, temporarily standing in for God. The color of anemone, purple, scarlet. Drops of semen dribble along the path. He is horrified. The white sand shines, a deserted battlefield. The things his body secretes, the things wet his brow. The things run down his thighs. The body he possesses, will it rupture. A room in the shade of a tree. Pollen is spilled across the floor. The sound of his breath carries through the air. Non-existence stand on the earth and listen. How about Narcissus? Yellow. What are words for? Ah, to fill your heart with precious things, but even so, you cannot love completely, the non-existence whisper to one another. Let's start with the phrase, the repeated phrase in an indented, italicized stanza, the things. The things his body secretes, the things wet his brow, the things run down his thighs. Um, uh, Emily, can we start with you? What what occurs to you when you see in this poem that sequence of reference to things? Yeah, it seems at first that the things in question are all bodily secretions, but I think um, the vagueness of that word is particular and meant to gesture outward and away from the body while still referring specifically to it. Mm -hmm. And Yosuke, a question for you. Um, the things... Did, did that easily translate? Is that a very difficult uh, thing, as it were, to do? Does it refer to things in the sense that we in American English mean, such as, you know, the cup, something thingy? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, we had uh, some discussion on that. Uh, so uh, in the original text, uh, the poet uh, uses mono, Mono means things yes. or the, uh, some uh, uh, idea of the, the, uh, the existence. So, so that the, uh, this part uh, doesn't uh, necessarily want to say uh, this is a real thing, but it could be some, uh, you, you know, the, uh, in some cases it's a, a creature or in some cases, it's a, a sort of the uh, so some thoughts or something like that. Ah, so, so th th yeah. things, things the way we mean them, particularly when we're dealing with imagist poems, things are concrete 
uh, materials. Yeah. And you're saying that the things here refers to that, but also generally to other things, such as thoughts and ideas. Um, Anna, thank you, Yosuke. So, so Anna, we encounter something twice. We encounter something called non-existence. Yeah. And that's not non-exist for those not looking at the text who heard Lily read what could be a homophonic double or pun, mm -hmm. non-existence meaning the opposite of living, of existence, of being. But this is... Existence, C-E. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. This is T-N-T-S, existence. And what? how would you translate that? Uh, how would you paraphrase that, not translate <laughs> it? <but> paraphrase <laughs> I was going to say. It. Yeah. Um, well, I think that that phrase especially is really interesting considering what Yosuke had just said about the um, the way that in the original text things is also this slightly nebulous word. It's both an object and also kind of a concept or a thought or an right. idea. Something imagined. Yeah. And non-existence, to me, I guess that's kind of atypical, right? Like we don't really see that used as like a noun so much to refer to like non-existent beings. Yeah. Um, if but I don't I know. Were... I think I think of like spirits. I think of um, something that's both there and not there. You know, they're we're telling me they're it's saying that there's something that's not there, but that they are standing on the earth and mm. listening. Um, Kamara and Lily, if I were to come up to you and say in non-poetic speech, um, th th think presences that are not here or ghosts whisper to one another. That would be one thing. But in poetic language. Uh, Nakamoto rendered into English by Jeffrey and Yosuke says the non-existence whisper to one another. So how how do you respond to that? Who who, who is that? And particularly in a poem that has emphasized things so adamantly, Lily. Well, I think the only other um, uh, human-like or maybe um, generally human figure in the poem is the white man standing in for God. So if you compare a non-existent to a God figure, there seems to be some kind of like power parallel there or um, like maybe non-existent is from the perspective of the God. Like they clearly exist because they're doing actions. So they can't be not totally non-entities. So to me, it seems like I would interpret it as like um, authority and subject almost. Mm -hmm. I, I want to turn to Yosuke after Kamara's comments to ask a little bit about that word in the original because it could be ghosts, it could be spirits, it could be ancestors, it could be absences. And I don't know if anyone else thought of this, but I just thought of like the like the pre-human, whoever that is, mm, yeah. like the pollen, the semen. I, I like when I saw the non-existence, that was like the first like figure-ish, eerily thing that came to mind, these, like, pre-human mm. things. Like it could be no longer existing. Things. Yeah. Uh, kind of like the elements. Quick, yeah. yeah. A I quick follow-up uh, to Kamara or anyone before we turn to Yosuke. The, um, is it possible that the conversation that just, just took place toward the end of the poem is the thing that then afterwards hmm. Nakamoto says was the whispering among the non-existence, and if so, what would that mean? Uh, uh, s one of the non-existence in my reading of it says, what are words for? Which is, you know, a classic modpo question. Uh, you know, it's a meta-poetic question, what are words for? And then the answer is, what would you say the answer is? Ah, to fill your heart with precious things, but even so you cannot love completely. What's, what's the answer? Anyone? Let's w paraphrase that answer. Ah, to fill your heart with precious things. I guess to create desire or to, because if your heart is full of things, maybe that means like, I would associate thinking of heart in the I way of like heart meaning love or lust. Um, if your heart is full of things, maybe those are things that you're lusting after or desiring after. Emily, I'm asking about a theory of poetry here in this conversation. What are words for? Answer? Oh, to fill your heart with precious things, but even so you cannot love completely. What's the theory of language or of poetry there, Emily Harnett? Yeah, it's language as some type of private, uh, purely interior pleasure um, that actually can't really communicate or can't communicate enough. It's a kind of erotics of language, um, 
that uh, obtains in spite of language being more or less ineffective. It's an erotics of language. And so when we get back to talking about this poem as an imagist poem, we need to think again about the imagist poems we've encountered in English um, where there is an erotics. Uh, Yosuke, um, the non-existence, uh, how difficult was that to translate? And what, what's, what's, what are some other synonyms for that word in Japanese? Yeah, so uh, actually, the Nagamoto also uses mono uh, for this uh, uh, line. Really? Uh, so, uh, uh, first, uh, the Jeffrey Wait, I'm sorry to interrupt you. you are you uh, yes. Are you saying that the same word for things is the word for non-existent? Yeah, so the non-existent thing, uh, Jeffrey translated. But the Nakamoto said, this is not thing. Please remove this word. So we changed it. Wow. Interesting. That is not a connection that we would be making in English. Yeah, but the, uh, we do have double meaning in this uh, word mono. One is for the thing, another is the two person. We all also call the person mono. So wow. uh, this wow. is kind of confusing and double meaning or something like that. I'm really glad we're not doing this close reading without you. <laughs> um, may I ask you what, um, whether a word can also be a thing in the sense of, did you say mono? Mono, yes. Yeah. Is, a, is it possible for a word to be one of those things also? It's kind of, uh, if you could uh, you call a word a thing, it's okay, but the, uh, it's a much more con concrete thing, like a cup or something, or a person. Oh, you you picked up a cup in a mod po kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> you <Yeah>. almost yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Where is your mod po cup? We need to send. Yeah, there you go. Oh, Yosuke, you're one of us. Um, may I ask one more question of Yosuke, and then uh, I want us all to turn to the question of imagism. Um, so, imagism. What? Why is I've asked you this before. When you visited, when you visited here at the Writers House, we had a, a a short interview, and I asked you this question, but I can't wait to ask it again. Mm -hmm. um, this is a complicated historical and even political question, but I don't mean to get us onto history and politics. But aesthetically, poetically, um, Japanese post-war Japanese poets who were interested in modernism were interested in imagism. Yeah, and Nakamoto is an example of that. Can you say? I know it's a big question, but can you say why Nakamoto would call herself an imagist, and how much does that relate to Anglo-American imagism of the early modernist period? Mm -hmm. Th that's a very interesting question. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, please remind that the, the imagism with the Western imagism is also influenced by the Japanese haiku. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. So they uh, we reinvented or re you know the uh, introduced the haiku uh, modernism uh, to to the our own culture by the eye of the Western people. So yes. this is very you know unique. Uh, thing for us, for for ourselves, uh, to look at ourselves uh, by the, the others, uh, in culture, other cultures' eyes. So this is very new to us. Yeah, I want yeah. to get back to the question of Japanese poetry and imagism toward the end. But let's let's go from there. And Emily, you're you're up next here um, to talk again about imagism and the question at the end of this poem about what words are for. So let's, let's uh, dust off our thinking about imagism and all of us, starting with Emily, talk about what are the, p what are the pluses and minuses of imagism with respect to things and words. Remember the phrase here is precious things. Precious things. Precious runs both ways. Precious is at its best, something that HD might have encountered, something particular, something compelling, something radically condensed that is precious in the sense of value. 
but precious also at its worst in imagism makes a, a kind of fetish of the of the little object and makes it too too sweet too nice so um, Emily starting with you let's remind ourselves what's at stake in imagism and as you speak relate it to the Nakamoto poem in any way you can sure um you know, as Al, as you just suggested, imagism allows words to take on a more concrete meaning and introduce um, some of the type of artistic te techniques that we see in fine art. But on the other hand, it's also such a precise aesthetic that it does also limit in some way what words can do and favors the concrete over the broad and the abstract and, um, and the non-concrete. Um, yeah, and I think this poem seems so attentive to precisely the type of concrete materials which also open up into new kinds of existence, new modes of being, as Kamara was suggesting, is material which is uh, pre-human and non-human and concrete and um, abstract at the same time. I'm going to turn to Anna next to ask the same question about imagism, but meanwhile, Emily, can you look at the text of the poem and just name one instance where that particularity is evident and pays off. Um, right, right now. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm thinking actually of semen, of, of, of precisely a type of complicated organic material mm -hmm. in that sense, um, mm -hmm. and of non-existence of that as a noun, which seems to be a thing, but also uh, to gesture to the state of non-thingness in a sense. Yeah. Um, how does Nakamoto as feminist imagist or imagist feminist self-declared uh make semen not symbolic um it's something that's secreted from the body um i i think it's it's gestured to uh in precisely the terms that it exists as a material thing mm -hmm. um and it's not taken up into some type of yeah into into a more abstract reading i don't think yeah that's terrific and what, uh, as we're turning to Anna, let me just point out a parallelism. Uh, drops of semen dribble along the path, parallels with pollen is spilled across the floor. So you get, uh, a and uh, Jeffrey and Yosuke did what I imagine, because I don't know the original, a deliberate attempt at creating those, um, the parallel of those prepositional phrases along the path across the floor. So what you get is semen as a pollen. This is, this is exactly what Emily was just saying. Um, Anna, say something about imagism with respect to this poem. Um, I think what I've always really loved about imagism is the way, um, especially in the sort of the order that we encounter in the course, like there's something about it that feels very fresh and very new. Revolutionary. It does, yeah. Um, you know, when you get a two-line Williams poem, uh, leaves are gray green. The grass, the glass broken, bright green, and that's a poem. I mean, that's like that's a radical, revolutionary notion. Right. Um, but I think Emily's exactly right in that sometimes the focus so much on the thinginess of the things um, can so kind of exclude lots of other uh, concerns mm. that sometimes I think we mm. want our poetry to be concerned with. Um, so to me, what's so great about this poem? Because it's narrow. It, it can be a little narrow, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what's so wonderful about this poem to me is that in those moments where it is like tightly focused, um, where we have one color, where we have drops, where we have white sand shines, um, it also then sends us back out wide lens um, to words like things that, like we just said, can mean so many things. <laughs> yes, well said. Um, Kamara and then Lily, and then I want to turn back to Yosuke to ask a couple of general questions about the poem and also about imagism in Japan. Um, Kamara, your thoughts about imagism here? How are you feeling about imagism after reading this poem? Um, you know, I, I kind of want to go on the trail that Anna and Emily were talking about. I felt like imagism... I, I kind of liked it during the course, but it felt exclusive in some sense, um, just in terms of like um, understanding it and meaning and symbolism. Like I felt like there was one way, and I think for this poem, um, I feel like the the things and the non-existence, especially since like now knowing that they come from the same Japanese word almost, it feels like while there is this. Um, 
imagistic um, images, images in like other sense that are like very concrete and like drops of semen. They're definitely drops of semen. <laughs> um, I think the things and the non-existence give this like inclusion that I really enjoy. Nice. Um, so we, that's where we're going to get back to at the end when we turn to Yosuke, which is a question about how Japanese modern and experimental Japanese poetry takes in <laughs> an Anglo-American modernist movement and then moves it forward by essentially restoring some of the original, shall we say, culturally mistranslated mm -hmm. borrowings from a Japanese poetic tradition. Sure. That's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna end up. But Lily, I want to give you a chance to say something about imagism here or imagism generally. How are you feeling about imagism these days? Well actually um going off of what Kamara just said and also thinking about um bar like a uh, relationship to an American and like maybe Williams um, centered imagism and Williams' obsession with spring, um, but thinking about how the occasion for this poem is the vernal equinox, which is very different than the middle of spring when seeds are actually sprouting. But or early or spring, early which spring. is what Williams was Yeah, really but so with. the vernal equinox is a day where day and night are equal amounts of time, and um, it's the very beginning of spring, and so taking the occasion of, of these two halves of the world or life being equal... Um, makes me it, I, I i like the the inset par um stanza the things his body secretes how th the things is taken as a subject and also um uh an object in that um paragraph so it's kind of like grammatically um centering on words that can be equal or that can have like equal dominion linguistically um so I like the, um, you could have, she could have chosen to focus just on a very springly image, but she's actually thinking about the equinox and like this moment of equality as translates to grammar. Yes, and also uh, spring in <coughs> images poetry is famously about things that are there, presence, mm -hmm. reality, the kind of mushy, squishy, uh, fecund existence. And non-existence are typically not part of that conversation. Um, Yosuke, uh, I want to try to summarize what, and you and I have talked about this before, summarize the circle that is achieved, that has been achieved in the uh, inter-animation cross-influence of mm -hmm. American modernism or Anglo-American modernism and Japanese poetry. I want to try to sort of... Uh, outline it and then give the floor to you to speak in whatever way you want about why you're in why you personally as a Japanese poet are interested in studying the poems in, in modpo in in English or what how, how your work with a poet like Nakamoto relates to your study of Williams and HD and so forth and anything you really want so I would say this and please modify it um, this this comes from talking with you and from reading um, the Japanese poetic tradition, part of the Japanese poetic tradition, of course, has always been about radical condensation and about uh, the particularity of language and also about how words are made. They're drawn, they're painted, they're things. That tradition was seized upon uh, with, in a kind of culturally imperialist uh, mood by people like Ernest Fenollosa, who reduced and condensed the tradition of condensation. Then Ezra Pound, who didn't read Japanese, sort of a, pretended he did, I guess, uh, borrowed from Fenollosa's borrowing to, in a sense, create imagism, which was all the rage for six months or two or three years. And other imagism imagists took from Pound what they took to be what in those days was called an Orientalist approach to radical condensation, and that became part of the revolution in American poetry, which we celebrate with some irony, but also some uh, reverence in Modpo. And then, here's the interesting part that you're an expert in, um, Anglo-American imagism sits there as a borrowing, then there's World War II in which Japan and the United States are uh, enemies. And then in the post-war period, Japanese poets seeking modernism as a way to break from the c 
conservative, traditional, and even fascistic elements of their own country seized on American modernism as a way uh, not simply to um, be part of a larger world, be more internationalist and less, um, less insular, begin to reinvest in American modernism and imagism in particular so that there's actually a magazine in the post-war period called The Wasteland. Famous mm -hmm. Japanese yeah. radical. Yeah. <laughs> so now you get a feminist imagist like Nakamoto who is returning it to people like HD and the circle is complete. It's not an uncomplicated circle, but it is a circle and it's a cross influence. And here we are, shall we say, to say the least, in the post-war art world, allies, sorry for the wor word, but allies in our interest in this kind of poetry. Can you say anything you want about any of that and also about Nakamoto and your feeling about all this uh, imagism? And thank you in advance. <laughs> so many questions. So uh, first I would say that the, uh, Nakamoto is not only the feminist and imagist, uh, she's also a surrealist. Yes, a surrealist. So another point. And uh, uh, Nakamoto's colleague, Agawai, said, once said that this is a very uh, interesting stuff uh, of the, the, the Jung, uh, C.G. Jung, uh, yes. also yes. applied uh, the Sora Palasman image. That means that the, the, the you know, uh, penis of the uh, sun uh, comes over into the, uh, onto the ground, and then make an intercourse with the uh the ground things right so this, the, this i'm sorry to interrupt the sun's tubular phallus reaches yes. the ground and impregnates everything and that's how you get spring yeah so this is very old you know um mitra uh you know uh, theory and uh, the myth yes. and uh, the the young has uh found uh, this image in this uh, patient's uh, dream. So uh, Jung found out that the, uh, the, excuse me, the collective the unconscious, collective unconsciousness using this uh, story. So this is a very famous story, but the Nakamoto said she doesn't know uh, this story at all when she wrote this poem. <laughs> So, so that so that the, this uh, uh, critic uh, Agawai said uh, Nakamoto is also kind of the uh, this patient, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, she is really connected to the collective, you know, unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. So this is a very interesting point. Yeah. So that yeah. that's why I picked up this poem into the Young Journal anthology. Mm -hmm. So that's the one point. And regarding imagism, uh, the I must say. Uh, the name of the Junzaburo Nishiwaki, who is a post-war poet uh, from the 1894 to 1982. This he's, he's a very great poet, and he was uh, you know uh, made, made many many uh, interactions between the Ezra Pound and the other guys, and uh, they made uh, you know uh, mutually influenced each other. Yes. So I don't think this is uh, so some so, so kind of the uh, imperialism or something like that. They are really mutually connected. And mm -hmm. Ezra Pound really uh, praised uh, the uh, Nishiwaki's uh, poetry con collection uh, called Ambarubedia. So this is very good uh, poetry. Um, but the, uh, after that, I guess I would say the uh, self-referentiality, self self-referentiality that you, you uh, defined as a proto modern American poets, uh, you know, is a uh, Emery or something like that. And, and another one, the imagistic way of writing have long been taken for granted as a criteria of contemporaneous of Japanese, you know, right. post-war poetry. So uh, we, I guess, uh this is a very uh something uh you know the 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 uh it was 
uh, kind of the uh, what you call the the same age uh, cultural phenomenon between Japan and the Western country. So we, we took together this uh, you know, sort sort of the uh, influence and uh, Nakamoto said that the she is very much you know influenced by HD and uh, William Carlos Williams and uh, other sort of the image sports. So uh, that's uh, that's it. And another one is that the I, I wanted to this uh, line a deserted battlefield. A deserted battlefield line in this uh, form. Yes. So I, yes, we uh, didn't talk about that yet. Yeah, the, this is a, a really self referential word for this poem. So I guess uh, Nakamoto uh, thinks uh, the poetry or the imagist poetry is the, the a kind of the uh, deserted battlefield without man, no man, no man land. Wow. That last point is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to go around and, and get final words from everyone. Uh, say anything at all that you want about the poem or about imagism or about this conversation that we've had. And Anna, would you like to start a final word? Sure. Um, I um, am very grateful that Yosuke reminded us that Nakamoto is also a surrealist. I think that definitely helps us kind of understand like the way that some of these images are working together and playing off of each other um and i want to just say that the the concept of being able to walk along the zodiac we didn't really spend a lot of time in that first stanza but that first stanza along the zodiac a white man walks temporarily standing in for god i mean that's pretty great (laughs) whoa (laughs) that 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 in itself could be a poem called vernal equinox yeah no kidding right it's amazing yeah Fantastic. Kamara, final thoughts? Um, you know, mm, one final thought. I um, appreciate that this poet is a feminist imagist, and I think that that um, comes across in the poem as well. When I was reading it, um, there's no like woman in the poem, maybe. Um, it's like focused on this man walking or these things. Um, but I think in some sense, the poem uh, trivializes this man walking, mm-hmm. standing in for God, um, trivializes like the semen and the pollen spilled on the floor. Um, and I haven't really delved into that as much as I wanted to but like that's part of the poem that I really appreciate yeah. just like mm. and, there, <laughs> and yeah. there is a speaker toward the end I yes. think a very Williams-esque intro, uh, however feminist it is mm-hmm. a, a, a Williams-esque inter- interrogation how mm-hmm. about Narcissus mm-hmm. says this voice yeah. Yeah. right and then suddenly the answer comes maybe from the man a dull answer yellow and then a conversation that might be between the speaker and the man, the white man. What are words for? And then there's an answer. So mm-hmm. it's possible that, or this could be the non-existence, but it's possible that the speaker is not going to keep herself from making comment. Um, Lily, not only did you want to respond to that, I could tell, but also do you have a final <laughs> word? Yeah, um, I think I really agree with Kamara's reading. I think that this whole scene with the man walking is almost irrelevant to what's going on with the non-existence yeah. like to me the two questions they're trying to have a conversation and almost being interrupted by all this that's going on so like mm-hmm. it's the color of anem- anem- anemone anemone yeah. can't, I've that word. <laughs> the color of anemone is one question and then how about narcissus is a follow-up question mm-hmm. um and so they're like trying to have this more philosophical conversation also about like what are words for yeah. um and it's kind of i see that as more um like in in general um you asked earlier this or brought up earlier this topic of like taking an earlier imagism and moving forward with it and i think an earlier imagism might have focused just on those two questions like how do i describe the color of anemone or narcissus and um then this poem then steps forward like literally indents a step forward with what are words for um so that's one way that the poem takes imagism like theoretically into a further a more like self-questioning mode. Yes, so good, Lily. Thank you, both uh, Kamara and Lily, for bringing that point up. Um, <coughs> it seems to me that the th- this is this is a it's con- it's a 
it's an images poem that's also a meta images poem in saying from its point of view about the man the question uh, an images might ask let's say hd of herself the color of an anemone in other words what's what's mm. and then an imagist in the sense that we studied imagism in modpo the early imagism would say purple or scarlet but you got to pick and here we have these two answers mm -hmm. in quotes spoken maybe by the non-existence mm -hmm. so that things are not, this may be the Jungian stuff coming through, things are not going to be definitively chosen, but we're going to have a conversation about the fact that the poet feels the need to pick one color. Mm -hmm. um, Emily, final thought, final word? <coughs> yeah, I've been thinking about what Yusuke just suggested about these the poems emerging from something like a collective unconscious, and that's been a, a kind of guiding principle in the composition of this poem. And that seems, I think, kind of the perfect uh, future for imagism, um, if imagism is to have a future, and clearly it is having a, a kind of robust transnational one. It takes an aesthetic which, in our class, we've um, talked about as being a little bit too limiting and opens it up not by um, opening up the tradition itself. Um, it maintains the kind of aesthetic, um, you know, delights of imagism, but still allows it to gather more meaning um, in a way which is uh, less, restric less restrictive and just uh, more liberatory, I think. I love that comment in so many ways. This, this poem was published in this journal. Um, the journal is called... Uh, Young Journal, Culture and Psyche, in its March 2016 issue, 2016. Imagism is alive and well and moving forward in the hands of this Japanese poet. And that's just like a perfect thing for readers of American poetry who don't know other languages s or who don't know Japanese. Uh, it's great to remind themselves of the fact that these that these movements are not necessarily insular and that the universality of the question, what are words for? And the answer is, well, they're substitutions uh, to fill your heart with precious things, but they're not going to do the job. They're, they're always inadequate. That reminder that imagism in its most you know, boastful, poundy mm -hmm. phase forgot completely which is to say, if you meet a woman at a party, you can turn her fingers into paper napkins, which is a definitive kind of colonizing move from the heart to the thing, from the subject to the object. And uh, uh, Nakamoto is really trying to complicate that again. Yosuke, I saved you for last. Um, you, you, would you like to offer a final thought or a final word? Wow, that's also very... Uh, so it was very, you know, honor for me for uh, discussing with you. But the, I must uh, point out one, uh, the last thing that Nagamoro interpreted with uh, this white man. She said, this white man means the sun. The sun is so, the white man, yes. Uh, the so zodiac. Uh, so that the, uh, and this is also a kind of man, so that this is, uh, you know, the, a metaphor of the male sexuality or masculinity. So this is uh, from the her feminist view of the of the male sexuality. And but the uh, so uh, for her this you know sexuality is uh, very uh, fragile and uh, uh, something uh, could be ruptured by itself. So uh, this is uh, how this uh, woman poem put. Uh, looks uh, into the uh, male sexuality, and this is uh, something thing, uh, very uh, special to this sport, in my opinion. So uh, perhaps the male sexuality in the <laughs> sky and the female sexuality in the, uh, you know, in the ground, and these two will meet together and make an intercourse. This is the uh vernal equinox i guess uh, what uh, this is what the this sport i wanted to say in this poem that's great and vernal equinox as lily referred to but it's worth repeating as my final word uh is is equal parts dark and light equal parts uh what's coming next and what's so there is a there's an equivalence an equality a balance and a mutuality that we get here that is implicitly defying the the part of the Anglo-American imagist tradition of the subject overwhelming the object. 
So you get subject-object mutuality. Um, the poet is Michio Nakamoto, and this poem, Vernal Equinox, has been translated by Jeffrey Engels, but also our friend, our Modpo colleague, Yosuke Tanaka, who is a fine poet in his own right as well as a translator. And I wanted to, th it, it's our honor to have you here 13 hours later in the day, <laughs> almost, mi almost midnight. Thank you so much for joining us. Will you do it again sometime? Sure, uh, let's do so. Uh, thank you so much, Al. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Emily Harnett in New Haven, we're looking forward to having you come back to Philadelphia. Thank you for joining us this morning. And Lily Apple. Oh, yeah, good. We are too. <laughs> Lily Applebaum, thank you so much. Anna Strong. Anytime. Kamara Brown. No problem. Thank you all. <laughs>